yeah, so my name is Arik. I'm with the chaplain services at the hospital. Um, I, I know some of you. I've seen a lot of familiar faces, but I don't know a lot of you. And so nice to meet you all. Um, so my role at the hospital is as a chaplain with the spiritual care team. My role, we, we tend to um, tether to emotional and support needs for families and for also staff. Um, it's, it's a, um, the role I think I've heard at one point is one who s assists so that a traumatic moment does not become a traumatic experience. So I, I like to think of my role as helping to hold space for people. Usually my role is on a smaller group of people, but uh, yeah, now it's in, in quite a big group of people. I'm gonna take a deep breath here. <laughs> um, so I had the honor actually to, um, to be invited to help to track and tether to the retelling of Thomas Mitchell, uh, the patient that we're inviting here to the keynote conference. Um, uh, and, and retelling and kind of re-interviewing re and holding space for the emotional quality of experience um, that uh, Thomas endured. Um, and his, his family and friends uh, were also present during his experience in the ICU at Boulder Community Health. And so I was also present with them during that. Um, so because of my involvement um, actually with Thomas personally in the ICU, it was Laura Harmon that invited me about a year later to uh, be a part of this uh, presentation and helping to continue to interview and um, tend to the uh, human elements with Thomas um, as, as we bring him to stage, of course. Um, so as we begin this process of welcoming Thomas and Nelson's story, um, I would really like to highlight this is actually a human story. Um, there's loss and there's trauma and there's intensity in this story. And to that effect, that, that effect, I really hope that you will all join me and join us in holding space as the story is retold. Um, so to that, I'd like to just invite you all to take a moment and inhabit your bodies and, you know, feel your seats beneath your, beneath your sit bones and, uh, tether to your, your, your basic human needs during this this retelling. Um, I will trust that all of you take care of your own needs um, and, uh, and you know, just on honor yourselves that there may be things that come up during this and it's important that you all, you know, take a moment to take care of yourselves if needed. Um, so further, Dr. Herman and I would like to acknowledge that this is not just the story of one person, but it's actually the story of um, Nelson uh, uh, Thomas's husband, and also the uh, the many caregivers uh, and, and providers that were uh, part of uh, of his caregiving during his life, uh, during his circumstances at BCH and beyond, and prior. Of course, we see some of the EMTs and police officers here. Um, so allow me to paint a really quick picture of Thomas. Uh, Thomas and, and Nelson met 21, 21 years ago, and at that time, Thomas was working as a massage therapist and doing landscaping here in Boulder. Um, Nelson was in hotel management in Denver. They eventually found themselves living in Boulder, but only after their time in Vail. Nelson works as a finance manager at the Center for Teaching and Learning at CU Boulder, and Thomas, at the time of the accident, was working um, in the parking department at CU. Um, since then, uh, and currently, he's resumed doing, um, uh, doing remote work. They're lovers of culture and have quite a robust community and social life. They both express their love of traveling, eating out, outdoor activities such as hiking, paddle boarding, and biking. Um, they have a really playful relationship that I feel like I've been so happy to bear witness to um, amidst this uh, re-interviewing and reconnecting. Um, they love to surprise each other with experience. Um, in, in one of our dialogues, they recalled a story where Thomas had surprised Nelson by presenting him with a bag containing swim trunks and winter garb. Um, Nelson, not having any idea about what was to come um, and thinking they were probably going to go into the mountains, um, was driven to a parking lot and was told, we're here. Uh, and Thomas had instead brought Nelson to an in indoor skydiving place in Denver. <laughs> um, so. With, with some of that brief insight into the a very short picture painted, 
Um, I'd love to invite Dr. Herman to illustrate further um, in sharing circumstances around the, the actual trauma event. Thomas worked at CU Boulder in the parking department. January 3rd, 2022 was a typical Monday at the parking office, answering phones, explaining to college kids why they got tickets. He headed home for lunch and he called his husband, Nelson, to see if he wanted him to pick him up lunch on the way home. He hit a pothole on 28th right before he exited CU. Not thinking too much of it, he continued on his way to pick up some chili on that chilly day. On Broadway at the intersection of Riley, Thomas realized he had a flat tire. He pulled over and called Nelson to tell him that he had a flat tire and that he was gonna fix it. He put on his flashers and pulled up the hood to get a spare tire. At 1.40 p.m., Brent Barquette was out walking his dog. He was across the street and noticed a car pulled over on the side of the road, but he didn't think too much of it. Moments later, he watched as Thomas got hit from behind, trapped between his car. Thomas was thrown up into the air, separated from his legs that were subsequently tracked underneath the car. Brent immediately called 911 and told him to come fast, that there was a man who had been hit by a car and he was really hurt. Brent ran across the street with his dog in tow. At that time, he was met by another bystander, Justice. Having a history in wilderness training, Justice immediately grabbed his belt and made a tourniquet. A third bystander offered a belt and both legs were tourniqueted. When EMS arrived, there was a half a dozen bystanders waving and pointing to the curbside area where Mr. Mitchell was located. An account from the paramedic. I knew time was critical for Mr. Mitchell as I stepped out of the ambulance and saw him, and him next to the car with his legs underneath of the car. I thought his injuries and blood loss were extreme. He was awake and talking to us the entire time. I remember asking him what his favorite sport was, trying to assess his neuro status and maintaining continuous mental checks with distracting conversation. He cheekily replied back, I think they're all terrible. <laughs> EMS teams applied cat tourniquets and rapidly loaded Thomas into the ambulance. Comments made by non-medical bystanders. It was impressive to see how fast and efficient the first responders were able to mobilize and get Thomas off the scene. I wasn't sure he was gonna make it. I thought for sure he wouldn't make it. EMS called Boulder Community Hospital with the call out. Where you brought up? Uh, 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 Ryan. What? No, Lord Hill, Baymore 12, how do you copy? Loud and clear. What would be emergent, full time activation, emergent, full time activation with a 54, 54 year old male, double amputation after being struck by a vehicle. Alert oriented, answer questions appropriately. We'll have our trauma at this time. We're working on a set of vitals and lines. We're going to be there in about 10 to 10. Any questions? All right, is he on any medication or blood thinners or anything like that? Not that I'm aware um, of at this time. No, I just met the past medical history. Any other questions? Nope, give us a call back if you have any more information. Copy. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas arrived at 2 p.m. with bilateral lower extremity tourniquets in place. Shortly after arrival, Thomas became unresponsive with a low blood pressure. Massive blood transfusion protocol was initiated. The decision was made to intubate him in the emergency room. While placing the breathing tube, Thomas's heart stopped. We performed several rounds of CPR and ultimately he regained pulses. We emergently took him to the operating room to control bleeding and reconstruct the wounds. Once all of the bleeding was stopped, Thomas was taken to the intensive care unit. He remained on the ventilator overnight and was ultimately extubated the following day. Thomas received a total of six PRBCs, two FFP, and one platelet. For our non-medical friends, that's about two and a half liters of blood or half of your total blood volume. On hospital day one, the breathing tube was removed and Thomas was able to speak for the first time. His first concern was connecting with Nelson. His second concern was addressing the pain in his arm. On further evaluation, Thomas had sustained a fracture to his left arm. Thomas was at Boulder Community Hospital for a total of 10 days. He had surgery to fix his arm, and then he began working with physical and occupational therapy and speech language pathology. The spiritual care team met with Nelson and Thomas to continue to support their emotional needs. Ultimately, he was discharged to Swedish Health One Rehabilitation Center. 
Thomas was at Swedish for an additional 25 days. Here, he and Nelson continued to work through the recovery process. Thomas had revision of his leg wounds and ultimately skin grafts. There, Thomas participated in three hours of intensive rehabilitation therapy. In March, Thomas and Nelson were released from the rehabilitation center. Their house, however, was not ADA compatible, so Nelson and Thomas had to move into a hotel. If you remember the timeline, the Marshall fires was just five days before his injury, which meant finding a contractor was nearly impossible. Thomas and Nelson traveled to Florida for another month of rehabilitation therapy. Six months after his injury, Thomas told Nelson, it's time to go home. They moved back into their home and with the help of a contractor, widened the doors so Thomas could get around the house in the wheelchair. Thomas and Nelson together pulled out all of the carpet on the first floor so that Thomas could move throughout the house. He still has never gone back to the second floor of his home. So as part of our style, I think Laura and myself as people, um, we wanted to kind of create a little bit of a different format for the way that we um, host this uh, keynote presentation. Um, And so in, in order for Uh, Thomas and Nelson's characters to emerge um, more clearly to everybody. Um, We, uh, you know, I I wanted to really just save this kind of possibility of of creating the already dry lecture style that I have personally. And then also, and then also a a PowerPoint presentation that I could put together that probably would be, um, you you know, maybe maybe interesting looking, but not that ultimately interesting. Um, And so we would actually like to invite uh, Thomas and Nelson up here to the stage, you know, in in real time to tell the story. And um, yeah. Would you please join us in welcoming Mr. Thomas Mitchell and Mr. Nelson Guerrero. When we were putting this talk together, we called it coffee talk. And so then all of us said, well, we have to have coffee for coffee talk. (laughs) Hi.
Thomas and Nelson, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you. Yeah, it's really wonderful to have you. Thanks. Yeah. Good to be here. How do you feel? Better now that I sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I still need to remember to breathe when I walk. What a concept, right? <laughs> I, I wanted just to start out by saying um, first big, big thank you for um, taking all the time over the past number of weeks that we've been together chatting and, and retelling the story. And I know it's it's been um, something to hold that. And on my side, personally, I feel honored that um, you and Nelson, that you both were um, so open in your vulnerability with allowing allowing me in, allowing me to, to come back and and um, it's, it's also a unique privilege for me as a spiritual care person because we don't often get to see the you know, people more than a couple of times in the hospital and then they're on their way. And so it was, a, it was interesting for me to be able to, you know, having spent so much time with you guys while you were at the hospital and also Chapel Jen, um, that, um, that it, it's, it's wonderful to be able to have this moment together. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you for your time you know, with us at the hospital and ever since. Um, I wanted just to take a moment, and during my time tethering to, to Nelson and, uh, and Thomas at the hospital, um, I wanted just to highlight their their unique resilience. Um, Thomas, in particular, I feel you really um, showed a quality during the time at the hospital that we don't often get to see people hold um, amidst such a traumatic circumstance. Um, I'll, I'll speak for myself and the other chaplains that were involved hopefully giving their words justice too. But um, it, it's a lot when, when families are in the ICU. It's already a very intense place. And, and then to hold space for families amidst that, um, it, it usually is, it's, it's work to make sure that people are tethering and finding their inner resiliency techniques. But you showed a resilience that I don't think a lot of people do during a moment like what you went through. And I wanted just to give some, some testament to your character here first off by showing that you know Thomas is not like other patients first off like I mean he's a human being <laughs> but he's but he he showed a unique resilience that I've, I really haven't seen in other patients it's amazing um, and to that end you know I'll, I'll say that um, kind of giving more insight into your character you know Nelson you had expressed that you had many prior ac accidents and that you were always sort of in a caregiving role for Nelson um, and, you, you know, you shared to me during that, that uh, during conversations that we had in the past that um, it was just sort of part of uh, Thomas's character to be a, a caregiver and, and, you know, certainly meeting during the time at BCH and then also the time um, uh, after, during our interviews subsequent to this or pr prior to this event, um, I really feel like I witnessed your, you know, e even though you're in your circumstances now, you still you know, you show up as someone who, who really cares for, for the other people around you. Even when I was welcomed to your home, you were still like offering me placemats and all the things. And it was just like, it was, it was a wonderful to, to, to witness and it was just part of your character. Um, and so I really just want to highlight your own compassion and your care. Um, and, and I feel like, you know, just taking the time that we got to spend together over the past couple of months, you know, maybe a month or so, um, I feel like I can really confirm that you embody humor and you embody kindness and you embody care. And it's a wonderful thing to witness. Um, I think it's part of your natural um, resilience in terms of being able to move forward um, with things. But um, I'm, one thing I, I want to ask you is, you know, if you might be willing to share with people a little bit about what got you through all this. I mean, highlighting your character is one thing, but could you share with people a little bit about, you know, how how you've been, you know, bearing and, and moving through all this. Sure, well, I would say first off is, you know, having Nelson as my husband is just, I mean, the day that I got hit by the car, calling him on the phone was my first response. And, you know, someone came up to me and said, you know, are you calling 911? I'm like, no, I'm calling my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Never even dawned on me. So I would say that, you know, he's been first and foremost, but then, you know, several things, I guess, have, have you know, got me with a positive attitude or moving forward resilience. 
And one thing, I remember when I was in the hospital, I said, I don't know where I, I heard this years ago, but it's just like, you know, in life, we don't get the, a choice and the cards were dealt, but we do have a choice in how to play the cards. And that's something that is, you know, stuck with me. And I try to, you know, embody and make it, you know, real. Um, and then there were some different quotes that were important to me. Um, a couple of these came from a, a woman named Nightbird, who she was on The Voice as a singer. She had cancer. Um, and she said, you can't wait until life isn't hard to decide to be happy. And then the other one she said is, I am so much more than the bad things that happened to me. So those things have kept me going. And then there was another one, I don't remember who this was from, but he who has lost confidence can lose nothing more. So quotes have been really important and, you know, family, friends, people bringing food, people coming over to spend time with me, people trying to get me out of the house, um, meeting people in restaurants, um, you know, learning to walk with prosthetics, having the prosthetic team. Jason's out here somewhere there. And the rest of the team there at Hangar, it's been great. Um, physical therapist. Um, and then, you know, just calming music that I listen to sometimes and get, you know, getting outdoors has been crucial. That's been probably, you know, one of the super important things. And I try to get on YouTube, listen to motivational speeches and not so it's you know, been a you know big gamut of things and you know just remembering all the care that I got you know at the hospital and still blown away with that so Test. There we go. <laughs> Take two. Um, there were a couple of things that you, that when we were talking, um, some experiences that stuck out to you that um, I, I thought um, would be worth unpacking. Um, the first was your experience on the scene. Um, and you kind of alluded to, you called Nelson, but can you tell us a little more about that? Sure. Well, do you want play-by-play play from the beginning. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, had a flat tire, pulled over to the side of the road, which wasn't really a side of the road, but um, turned on the flasher, raised the trunk, raised the hood, reached in to grab tire. Next thing I know, I see the hood of a car, then I'm on the side of the road, and I just remember, you know, reaching up, you know, to call Nelson, and there's like, blood all over my hand, all down my arm. Uh, sorry if this is too graphic for people, but it is. Uh, and then, you know, somebody walked up to me and said, um, you know, that they had medical experience and was it okay if they put tourniquets on my leg? I said, absolutely. And then they said, are you calling 911? I said, no, I'm calling my husband. Same like I said before. Um, then I remember getting, oh, then the EMTs, I guess it was, were there scissors cutting my clothes off on Broadway. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, I remember, you know, being in a lot of pain and saying I can't feel my legs, not knowing at that time what had happened. And then getting put in the ambulance, and I remember Nelson was there, and I saw him, and he said, I'm here. And then they they literally pushed him away and then closed the doors and took off with me. And then the guy in the ambulance, I mean, I, I understood what was going on. He was trying to keep me awake, but it got annoying. It's like, just let me rest, you know? <laughs> so he's like, so what do you, you know, do you like, you know, this football team or that football team? I'm like, no, no, no. Well, what about baseball? I'm like, no. And what about this? I'm like, I don't really give up about sports. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, well, what do you like? I said, I don't know. He goes, well, how about TV? I said, I guess, I don't know. It's just like, I don't know, I'm trying to pass out here. You know? <laughs> He's like, well, what, you know, tell me something. I was like, cartoons. He's like, okay, cartoons. Who do you like? I'm like, Bugs Bunny. He's like, oh, okay, Bugs Bunny. I'm like, do you like Daffy Duck and, you know, um, who 
was the other one? Elmer, I guess they said Elmer. I know, Daffy Duck and somebody. I'm like, yeah. And then the next thing I knew, I was out. And then was yeah. in the... So that's when you and I met shortly thereafter, but you don't remember that. No. <laughs> but you do remember when we were in the operating room. Will you tell us a little about that? Yes. Yeah, I was in the operating room, and I was laying on the table, and I looked around, and I saw a bunch of people, and they're, you know, like, moving fast as can be and screaming at each other, blah, 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 blah. Like, I'm trying to just let them know, um, hello, I'm still awake. <laughs> and I couldn't talk because I guess I had a tube down my throat, right? And I couldn't, I was trying to like raise my arm, I couldn't raise my arm, I could at least raise my finger to give him some, you know, notification that I wasn't under. And I, I was just terrified because I thought I was in a coma. I thought I was gonna be able to hear people and see people the rest of my life and not respond. And that, that was horrible. What, you, what do you wish would have happened then? I thought about that the next day, and I was just like, well, it would have been great if they could have put like a little sign in front of me. Hey, you know, you're in the hospital. We're taking care of you. You know, you're not in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> just like, but, you know, this is, you know, it's not a planned surgery. This is trauma. So it's, first off, no one's going to read my mind to know that, and they can't write that and give it to me because if I did slip in a coma, then, uh-oh, bad on them. <laughs> so, you know, I get it, but, you know, I, and then I found out the reason the next day. Yeah, which was that the paralytic had actually hit you faster than the sedation medicine. So um, remember I mentioned that Thomas died and we did CPR and brought him back uh, and we didn't know that his brain was in there. We didn't know that he was waking up. When we first talked about this, Thomas said, I just heard somebody with a naggy voice yelling. I think that was me. <laughs> um, but I think that that story really resonated with me because for a moment, um, my friend was suffering and there's a potential that I could have alleviated suffering. So one of the conversations that we've had through the last few weeks that we um, have been meeting is what things can we take from you to teach us how to be better providers? Mm -hmm. And one of the examples you gave us uh, was when you were leaving Boulder Community Hospital. Do you wanna tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Well, when I was to, to go to Swedish, yeah, when I was leaving, you know, they said, okay, well, we're going to transfer you to Swedish today. So I'm like, okay, fine. And, you know, they don't know that they gave me a specific, they didn't give a specific time, but they just said, you know, sometime this afternoon. So I'm like, okay. And so I called Nelson. He was at home. He was on his way over. And so I'm just obviously laying there in bed. And then they come in to take me and it's just like, okay, gotta get your stuff. Now we're moving right now. It's now, it's now it's just like, what's the rush? You know I mean? The trauma's over. <laughs> so, you know, they rushed to get me out and, you know, I knew Nelson was on his way. And then he's like, you know, they're loading me in the ambulance. He's like, well, I'm in the parking lot. And so he couldn't, I couldn't see him. And then I get bounced all the way down to Swedish and about halfway down there, I look around, I'm like, uh, I don't have a seatbelt on. Can you do that for me? <laughs> but the worst part about it when it was, my pain was getting worse the whole time. And when I got there, I was in excruciating pain and they couldn't do anything about it. Like we, we have to wait for doctor's orders. And the doctor that was there was very polite, very trying to calm me down. She's like, I get it, I get it. I'm like, you know, I'm not usually like this. I'm screaming, I'm crying. She's like, we'll take care of you. It's not, it's not gonna be long. And, you know, long is a relative term, I guess. But, you know, they did end up finally taking care of it. But it would have, you know, in the perfect world, um, I was due for meds at the time of transfer. And the perfect world, I could have, you know, gotten those before then. The 
people that were transferring me could have waited for Nelson to be there five more minutes to get you know all the stuff loaded because I think when you got there you just had to grab everything and run pretty much right or yeah actually the nurse actually, hi everyone. <laughs> the nurse actually uh, was waiting for me in the parking lot and she told me that you just left like a minute ago and she gave me your belonging. And we had a little chat about um, your legs. <clears throat> so that was um, because you, you were asking and then you were, it's okay. And you ask again and do was something about it. Um, so I start gathering information with the nurses and this last one actually said he keep asking about the legs. He said he, he's still asking about the legs. When? Today? Before he left. And that's when Eric helped us um, locate them and go through the entire process which was very um, unique for us and we didn't know it was new. So what we did, we cremated the legs, the remaining. Um, so we have it at home with us. And actually, um, when we picked them up, um, the, you know, I was unloading the car and him, and he was just like his right now, seated, waiting for me to get the rest of the stuff. So I grabbed this bag, not thinking what it was, and I gave it to him. I said, can you just hold this? And he was holding his, his ashes. And, and I was just like, oh my God. I mean, what a powerful um, and sad moment too. But he was there. You were having him and right next to you. So it was very powerful, very unique, and very emotional. And I took a picture of it. Um, no. I, didn't know you I didn't know you took a picture. No. <laughs> Surprise! I didn't, didn't want to say, oh, okay. smile. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nelson, I think it might be a good time to um, really kind of highlight you in, the, in this um, circumstance, you have gone from being a partner, collaborator, husband, best friend, and then moving into a caregiving role. And I'm um, just wondering if you wanted to share with people about what it's been like for you. I know that you had a certain circumstance at Swedish that you, maybe there was a mark of transition in that, and then, um, but then also you just, it sounds like you had moments of, uh, of coming to terms and yeah. Would you mind describing for people a little bit about yeah, I mean, first, uh, I just want to start by saying when Thomas called me and, and I, I was home, um, it was uh, the first time he called me, he said, okay, I got the food, I'm going home. And then he called me and said, I got a flat tire. I said, oh, where, Broadway? Oh, okay. Um, he said, well, I got to go. And then, you know, it's one of those moments that make you think, what if? I could have kept him on the phone with me three more minutes. You know, one of those things that he would have been hit while he was still seated in the car. So, um, you know, life is just surprising and, and sometimes very difficult to deal with. But at that time, um, when he called me back um, the first time, I uh, couldn't hear anything, so I said, honey, I think you bad dial me, so I'm going to hang up, three, two, one, and I hang up. Second time, within seconds, and again, nothing was on the, uh, on the other line, and I, I said, mm, you're still bad dialing me, so I'm gonna hang up, so I hang up. The third time he called, he was screaming, um, and he said, I got hit. So I was like, what do you mean you got hit? Someone punched you? And he said, no, a car hit me. So I ran out and I met him. Uh, Thomas, uh, since then, he's been saying several times to me, I'm sorry, 
that I call you, I'm sorry, that you have to see what you saw. Um, when he was screaming on the, on the phone, I said to him, I'm on my way and I'll be there. <clears throat> so I knew it was near. So by the time I got there, I, I, obviously I saw something that I would never expect him. Um, there were so many people um, and I got my way in to, through the wall of people and I, I was able to see him. He just saw me, I've never seen his face before, uh, so scared. So um, it's just difficult to explain. It was, it was, a, it was his eyes were like a child, like, like I've been hurt and I don't know what's going on with me. So he looked at me and I said, I'm here, honey. And he said, I can't feel my legs. So I looked down and, and it was horrible. I just didn't know what to say and then he was taken. Um, so, you know, a lot of times I think that, that the moment that I have to go there and be there, it was the moment that I needed to leave too. I needed to be there for you. And that was the, that was, that was the idea. It's just not to be sorry or not, you know, don't feel bad about it. I'm, actually, it was tough, difficult, but I needed to be there for you. And I was, and I made it on time right before. Oh, obviously I was beating like crazy and rough. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, yes. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but I made it, right? Um, the ambulance, I think, just got in there and then I pulled right before the ambulance. So it was pretty fresh what I saw. And you were naked, yes. <laughs> she was great. All now the clothes were knows. cut in half and I was like, okay. <laughs> Um, so, um, my experience um, taking on to this into um, maybe a role that I never pictured myself to be in, um, especially because I didn't have the experience how to take care of Thomas. Thomas always took care of me. And there were so many things that I wanted to do and I couldn't do. and. It was my time to learn, and, and it, was, it was a lot. It was a lot of responsibilities, and making sure that every uh, thing that you do was the right one, and it's very difficult. Um, it's very stressful, and, and, and then the, you see him, he's my husband. You see him again, he's someone who is injured, you see him again, and you just want to be there to listen to him through all the, the entire time. And a lot of times you kind of feel that you lose yourself in between so many um, people that are inside you. It's like one day I'm a nurse, one day I'm, I'm the cleaning person, I don't know. <laughs> Some other day I'm just listening to you and talking about life and uh, trying to inspire you. And sometimes I just can't hold them and I cry. So many times I come to you and just, and you're like, what's going on? I can't talk and, you know, I cry. And then you're like giving me support and it's incredible. And I remember one day when, when we were, um, the second time um, you were in ICU after the accident, um, and I, I just, you know, I, I make sure I cry not in front of him, and, and, and by the time I get to go through that door, move the curtain, and see him there, uh, and he would just look at me and I'll come in, hi, sweetie. I was a different person when I walk in. I was different, the person that, that left home. I was suffering every second. One of the things about Thomas and Nelson that um, Ark and I encountered when we were interviewing folks, so Ark and I spent time in connected with kind of his entire care team. And one of the things that they said over and over and over again was um, 
they were just astounded by the love you guys have for each other. Uh, and I think that um, it was really special to be able to see that um, and then continue to see it um, today. Um, the second thing is uh, that you guys have a really great sense of humor. So, uh, Nelson, tell us a little bit about when you became a nurse. Um, so, I, I, you know, being at Swedish, I was there pretty much every day. Yeah, every day. Oh, my God. So, um, you know, you, he needs to use the restroom. He needs to do certain things. Uh, so I learned every time someone will do something for him, I was just paying attention. And at times I said, can I do it? Can I do this? Can I do? So I learned a lot, um, the basic stuff, how to take care of him um, and move. It was dif difficult to see him at first because um, when he was moving on top of the bed, he will do, you know, move like that. And I was visually, I was never... Um, used to see him like that and he that was him again and and it was tough and so many times just turn around and just cry and then well, ah, hey good good job you know um so i learned so much that actually on the board they put the name of the doctor and the person who is on shift and my name was there <laughs> <laughs> and actually it was it was i was happy because i felt you know, like I could do something without supervision. Um, so, well, and they, it was they, such had, a, they uh -huh. put you there too. They had cleared you for certain responsibilities. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So sometimes they're like, oh, "Who are you? What are you doing?" This is like, my name is there, and I'm clear. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, okay. Oh, you are the husband. Yes. Oh, oh, I've heard about you guys <laughs> so many times." Um, so um, what happened is that I. Since I become, on, uh, I was on the board. I, I start playing like, hey, when are you gonna? When I'm gonna start getting paid? <laughs> and nurses start, you know, joking with me back and forth and so on. And one day I make up something, a story, and I said, uh, make up the story that I was graduating. Oh, because they actually, oh my God, they made a badge for me. <laughs> they, they, they went into uh, the the. Um, Internet, they found my name, see you, easy to find me, cut the picture and put it there and it says registered nurse Nelson Guerra, no, N Guerra. And uh, oh my God, it was just super cool. And I wore the badge, I put some tape and I put it there. So I walked the hallways, by then everybody knew us. I said, hi Nelson, hi Nelson. So people started looking at this stuff. So then someone came in and said, look, I graduated. And they were like, Oh, as a nurse. Yes, I graduated as a nurse. Well, that person told someone else and someone else told. <laughs> there was a group of nurses coming in and said, congratulations, we just heard the news. <laughs> How amazing that you actually can take it. And I said, oh my God, thank you so much. <laughs> because I was thinking that they were joking and they, they took it so seriously and they... <laughs> and then, at the end, it was just so amazing. So I was, I was a nurse. <laughs> so cl clearly amazing sense of humor and also amazing just playfulness with life, with reality. Um, but I'm curious, you know, I, I wanted to just see what other things uh, helped guide you through this process. How did you uh, resource internally and um, what, how, what did you do to bring you through um, this sort of generation into this new role? Oh, it's, it's been a, a work in progress. I think it's from the very beginning, I didn't know what to do. Um, you just wanted to do something that is meaningful for the other person, but you don't know if that's correct. For example, um, didn't know at the beginning it, when it was right for me to be there for him, meaning you're okay to do this by yourself because you want to prove yourself that you can do it. But what if you fell or, or you know, miss step or whatever, and then I couldn't get you. So a lot of times me going into that, he will be like, no, no, let me try. So sometimes I will let him try and he's like, 
come over <laughs> so right away. When is the right time for me? Um, I think the, the inspiration and all that, it was himself because I learned so much from you taking care of me and all that. It's funny because <clears throat> one day um, when I was visiting my, I'm from Chile by the way, so I was back in Chile and my friend who is very unique, he's a painter, unfortunately, unfortunately he, he passed away, he, he died a few years ago, but he, he said, I, can't, I don't understand how many years you've been with Thomas. What, what, make, what make you being with him this, this, this long time? And the word that came to me was kindness. And I said, kindness. And he said, kindness. What an interesting word. What? What did I say? Kindness. I didn't know why I said that. And I said, oh yeah, I play along. Yeah, kindness, you know. But I never really understood what I said at that time. Years passed and I told you that. And I think what happened is when I had to think of Thomas in that moment, that's all that came in my mind because to me he represents that. So at the end, that's what I learned from you. I learned to take care of you based on what you did for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe switching gears just a little bit, I wanted to see how um, how you ended up getting reconnected with BCH and just sort of that, tracing that um, series of events. Well, it, it was interesting because Nelson and I had been talking and you know, how can we reconnect with people you know, at the hospital? Do you guys I want to go back and say thank you to people, et cetera, and just like, well, you know, I don't, not like you can just like show up. Hi, I'm here, and um, can I get a tour and see everybody? And this is more going to the ICU and see these people. I can't remember their names. I don't know what they look like. Cause I had a mask on because it was COVID. <laughs> 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 but <clears throat> and we'd been talking about that for months, probably a couple of months. And then I got a phone call, and they said, "Hi, I'm calling for Dr. Harmon's office, and she'd like to, you know, have you come in just for a follow-up visit." I'm like, "Cool." So. We get to come in, <clears throat> excuse me, and you know, reconnect. And <laughs> one of the things I think the first it was the first visit that I had had this little thing on my residual limb, politically correct term, um, and it kept there was like a little irritant, and it kept on like this little blister would come up and then it would scab over and it would come off. And this had been going on for months, and I didn't know what it was, and when I was in different rehabs, they looked at it, and they're like, well, we don't know, and one place dug into it, well, we couldn't find anything. Well, by that time, a stitch had started to surface. So when we got, you know, to see Dr. Harmon, we, you know, she came in, like, hi, hi, and of course, a lot of, you know, hugs and tears and stuff, and I told her, I said, I didn't realize you were so funny. And she's like, what do you mean? I said, you've kept me in stitches for months. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just, it was, a, I mean, from the second, you know, you open the door, even though I couldn't remember your face because you had the mask on <laughs> during COVID, but it was just, you know, immediate reconnection and, you know, has, you know, transitioned into a good friendship. I think that's one of the things um, our friendship, our relationship, um, meeting you here, happened pretty quickly after I had moved up here. Um, and when I called you, or when the office called you, it was because I just hadn't seen him. And I, I said, hey, what, what happened to Thomas? Somebody find him and get him back here. Uh, and so he came back to clinic, and uh, our friendship has really fostered this idea that our trauma patients need a place to anchor. And so really our entire practice the last year has transitioned into this place where trauma patients can come back and have a home. And they'll go out into the community and they'll see other physicians and they'll, um, and they'll get other services, but they need a place to be able to come back to. And so that was really the start of our relationship of, of building a 
healthcare home for you to come back to, but also doing that for everyone else that comes after you. That's awesome. Very much needed. So I, one of the other things that uh, in our former conversation that we all had together, um, there was a mention that you were a hospice caregiver at one point. And of course, a un another unique reference point to have prior to going into this, um, and, uh, and maybe an illust a further illustration for people about your, your caregiving nature. But um, I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you, knowing the possibility to go into a, a mentorship role for other trauma survivors, would you take that possibility and would you step into that? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's needed. And but, you know, the, th the thing that, you know, Arik is referencing is when I was, you know, working with hospice, one of my roles was to do follow up, <clears throat> excuse me, with the surviving spouse or whoever significant other. And I would just make a phone call once a month for, I think it was six months, maybe a year. And just to say, hey, this is Thomas, you know, calling you from hospice. And let them lead the conversation. If they wanted to talk about the person that had deceased, that's fine. If they want to talk about the dog, the weather, if they say, I don't want to talk to you today, hang up. Okay, cool. But at least it was a way that, you know, I could reach out to let them know that they're not alone. And that, you know, if they needed support, that I was there for them. And that's something that would be great to, you know, have for trauma survivors. This is Thomas's shameless plug for the Trauma Survivors Network. <laughs> um, so he actually told me that story and um, I just, like my heart just swelled uh, because one of the other projects that we're working on here at Boulder Community Hospital is actually bringing the National Trauma Survivors Network here. And one of the things that they do is connect trauma survivors with trauma patients when they're in the acute phase. And so Nelson and Thomas will be our first of the trauma survivor mentors that we will call and will come back and help shepherd patients through that phase of care. Thomas and Nelson, um, just thank you so much for, for being up here with us and being vulnerable and, and with your great courage, sharing uh, your story with everybody. I think it's, uh, I'll speak for myself, but it's, it's enriched me and I hope that it's been enriching for everyone else. Um, but before we move on to our next section, I, I really just wanted to give you another opportunity to, if you had any other things that you'd like to share or some final thoughts. Um, let's see. Just a, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I think it's just, maybe jumping ahead here, but, um, you know, things that well, I think that I want people to know that I think would be good for everybody. Just please, you know, if you do have a flat tire or something, you know, get off the road, walk away from the car and call, you know, whoever, if you have roadside assistance with an insurance company or AAA or whoever, if not, get it. It's cheap and it's worth every penny. Um, also, maybe work on yourself to, uh, to be ambidextrous because <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. Um, and just, just be grateful, you know, for what you have every day. Um, and look for the good in every day because there is good in every day. I've got, we're not to closing thoughts yet, right? Or yes, we're at the end. If you have the bandwidth for it, okay. we would love to hear. Your yeah, there's, I've got you know, two more quotes. Well, I guess it's one quote in a Thomas original. <laughs> um, the quote was, you know, we aren't who we were, but we don't know who we will become. And then there is a time I think it was, a, it was after I had gotten back to the house and I was just struggling. No, maybe it was before that, maybe it was in the hospital. I don't know, at some point. Um, I was just struggling with doing something and I just, I don't remember if it was like rolling over or transferring or something. I was like, oh, oh, I just can't do this. 
and immediately from somewhere into my, something came into my head and said, the only thing you can't do is keep can't in your vocabulary. And that just like, and it's, you know, I've called on that several times, you know. Um, and another just, there's some, of, you know, people talk about simple acts of kindness and something that I never would have expected from people and I would never expect what an impact it would have. There was a plumber that came to my house and he was, you know, I was telling him what was going on. And he walked in and he started to talk to me and then within three seconds, he squatted down and he was at eye level. <laughs> and I don't know why that was so impactful, but it just, it's just like, you know, here is total stranger <laughs> that sees that he cares and wants to connect with me. And that little transition was huge. Um, and then another uh, person that's been, you know, with me in spirit and in, you know, text daily, um, I want to put out a thank you to Jolene. I think she's here someplace, but maybe, oh, there we go. Um, thank you. Um, every day she sends me quotes and has done that pretty much since I was in the hospital. And it's just a, a simple act of kindness, but it it's means so much to me. So thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody, you know, friends and family that supported me, um, and especially those of you that were here with Nelson the, the day that I got hit by the car. That's huge. Um, the list is way too long to go on, you know. Um, and so thank you for the people that are here, the people that are watching on the web, the people that, you know, I've yet to share this with, but I will. Thank you for everybody. And finally, I just want to say thank you to the medical staff here uh, that deals with trauma daily. Uh, I want to say thank you from me and also from the people that have never said thank you to you because you deserve it. And I think most importantly, I hope you all have the support that you need. I can't imagine doing what you all do on a daily basis. And it's tough. And especially the last few years with COVID, it's been even more so. So, you know, please take care of yourself and get the help, get the support that you need. And if you, if you can't, you know, if you don't know how to get it, ask. Um, if you're really struggling, talk to Eric, get my phone number, I'll talk to you. <laughs> but, um, you know, none of us should be alone dealing with trauma. So thank you. I think we're going to transition into our next portion. So um, if you all will join me in thanking Thomas and Nelson um, one last time, and then we're going to thank our heroes. <laughs> <laughs>